That was kind of cool. One website offered 40 three-word sentences that motivate, inspire, encourage, and make us feel new again. Here's just a a few of the three-word sentences. Believe in yourself. Count your blessings. All is well. Dreams come true. Never give up. Live for others. Never look back. And I was kind of surprised that three words not on their list to inspire. I love you. I love you. A wife said to her husband, I love you. Husband asked, is that you or the wine talking? She said, it's me talking to the wine. (laughs) Why does the singer Bono always say to his audiences, I love you? It's because he wants to hear them say, I love you too. You too is the name of the band. Five hardest things to, to say. Number five, I need help. Number four, you're right. Number three, I'm sorry. The second hardest thing to say, I love you. And the first hardest thing to say is Worcestershire sauce. (laughs) You say it. A husband was late coming home from work one night. His wife left him a note on their dresser that said, I've left you because I don't think you love me. Then she hid underneath the bed to watch his reaction. She heard him in the kitchen before he came into the bedroom. She watched him pick up and read the note, and he wrote something on the note. Then he dialed on his cell phone and said to someone, She's gone. I love you. I can't wait to see you. He hung up the phone, grabbed his keys, and left. She heard his car drive away. She came out from underneath the bed in tears and picked up the note to see what he wrote on it. The note said, we're out of bread. I'll be back in 15 minutes. I can see your feet under the bed. (laughs) P.S. I love you. And what is love? We've assembled 100 experts who have indisputable uh, answers for defining love. Take a look. What is love? Um... Uh, let's see. Uh, no idea. I do not. I don't know too much about it. Love means like you love someone, love something, love them. You fall in love with another person. What is love? The thing that you like love people. Love is like a way of saying, I got you. Huh? I got you. A what? I love you, is what you're saying. Oh, I love you? Yeah. Aw, thank you. But, uh, what is love? It's where you care about somebody and you live with them and you just love them. Like your boyfriend or your mom or dad. Do you have a boyfriend? Love means when home you be nice and not mean and... You're interested in a person. It's a feeling of happiness. It's a sign of happiness. Love is feeling. 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 A good feeling. A warm feeling. It's a feeling and kind of a taste. Where in your body do you feel love? Oh, mostly to the right, but sometimes the left. In your heart. Hot. Hot. My feet. What is love? Love is something that everyone has, but they still have to find. Sometimes you can get mad. Sometimes feels uncomfortable. It's an emotion. A heartbeat. Love smells like flowers. Love being like butterflies. It could mean different things, like you could like love your family. Who's some people that you love? My friend. My mom. What is love? That's what is love. What is love? Huh. I actually have no idea. I don't know. I don't know love. Love is a thing that you like. It's when you like like, like somebody. You like someone. When people like each other. A lot. A lot. Like a lot, a lot. When two people really, 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 really really like each other. So much. If you like someone and you want to marry them. Love is when you get married. You get married. You have like a good relationship. What is love? A lion. A fire. What is love? Uh, 
angel. To me, love is disgusting. Love is not being fake. When two people find each other in the world, carry for someone. Caring about someone with, with your whole heart. That you can trust. Someone you trust. It's a passion thing. When you're really happy. Mushy gushy. Kissing somebody and hugging somebody. When you hug someone. Two people kiss. Kissing. Kissing, kissing, kissing. Mm -hmm. Love? What Love is, is like What is that? This straws. Straws? How can you argue with that? Psychology Today defined love as a force of nature. We can't command it or demand it. It strikes like lightning. It's unpredictable. You can even find yourself loving someone you don't like. True love doesn't come with conditions or stipulations. It's free. Can't be bought. Can't be sold or traded. You can't make someone love you. And even if you had all kinds of money, you can't buy it. Sex can be bought and sold, but love cannot. You can buy loyalty and companionship but love can't be bought. Love, can, love can't be turned on as a reward and turned off as a punishment. Love allows room for anger, grief, and pain to be released and expressed. It doesn't threaten to withhold itself if it doesn't get what it wants. Love is empathetic and compassionate. Many medical websites list the benefits of love. One website a Dr. Harry Reese said many of the research centers on marriage, much, much of it does, but many of the perks extend to other close relationships, including a partner, a parent, or a friend. The key is to feel connected with other people, to feel respected, to feel valued by others, to feel a sense of belonging. And that website lists 10 benefits, uh, health benefits of love. Number one, Fewer doctor visits and shorter hospital stays has been proven. Number two, less depression and substance abuse. Number three, lower blood pressure. Number four, less anxiety. Number five, love is a natural pain control. Number six, there's a link between love and stress management. Number seven, loose, love boosts the immune system and those who are loved are like, uh, less likely to get sick of cold or flu viruses. One university medical center determined that those who were loved healed nearly twice as fast from flesh wounds. Number nine, love contributes to a longer life. It wards off feelings of isolation. And they conclude love provides a happier life. The article says, shared sorrow is half sorrow. Shared joy is double joy. What is true love? Well, the Greeks had eight different types of love. The first was eros, or erotic love. It's named after a Greek god. The ancient Greeks considered this dangerous love because it involves the primal impulse to procreate. And when eros is misused, abused, it leads to impulsive acts and broken hearts. Philia is affectionate love, friendship between equals. Plato felt that physical attraction wasn't necessary for love, hence platonic, that's where it came from. It's love between friends. Storge, or family love, is between parents and children or between children and other children. Ludus is playful love, affection, fluttering heart, flirting, teasing, feelings of euphoria, it's been referred to as innocent love. Mania, doesn't sound so good. That's obsessive love, possessive, jealous of the one you love. It's very codependent. Pragma is enduring love that has aged and matured and developed over time. It's love between those who've learned to make compromises, who have demonstrated patience and tolerance in order to make a relationship work. Felucia is self-love, can't share what you don't ha have, 
If you don't love yourself, how can you love anyone else? And then agape, selfless love, the highest type of love according to the Greeks. It's unconditional. It's referred to as spiritual love. It's love regardless of flaws and shortcomings of others. Trouble happens when one person wants one type of love and another wants another type of love. Like in John chapter 21, Jesus asked Peter if Peter agape loved him, and Peter responded that he phileo loved Jesus. Peter, do you love me with the highest unconditional love that you reserve for God? And Peter said, I love you as a friend. And that happened three times. And Peter refused to upgrade his love, so Jesus downgraded his by asking, do you even like me? Lots of Christians want Jesus as a friend, and they don't commit to much more than that. The Bible says that love originates with God. Long passage in 1 John 4, I won't read it all, but it defines love, including the three famous words, God is love. That's the eighth verse. In verse 16, it says, God is love. God is agape. And if we're created in his image and by his power, we can love as he does. 1 Corinthians 13 only talks about one kind of love, and that's agape. And if we want to have the best kind of love, we have a description of how it looks and how it acts in 1 Corinthians 13. It persists regardless of circumstances. It goes well beyond emotions and seeks the best of others. It's sacrificial love. It's how God loves us. John 3.16 might be the most famous verse in the Bible. It's been called the gospel in a nutshell. And it only sounds right in the King James translation. So John 3.16, if you know it by heart, say it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God gives us this perfect agape love, the kind we should give to others. Paul's final adver uh, advice to his church in Corinth, we've been going through 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, Paul says, do everything with love. Do everything with agape love. C.S. Lewis wrote the book, The Four Loves, and he says agape love is the highest form. It's a selfless love that God has for us, and C.S. Lewis says it's passionately committed to the well-being of others. It's unconditional, voluntary, non-discriminating. It's intentional. Who wouldn't love to be loved like that? There was a 1980s country music song called Looking for Love. Remember that song? But that's kind of eros or phileo love. And it leaves many with feelings of guilt and resentment and emptiness. Maybe we should try looking for love in the right place. Agape is seldom the theme of TV or uh, movie relationships. It's because the world peddles a different kind of love. And R rating stands for rotten, raunchy, and ruin. Regular movies portray love as conditional, selfish, impatient, unkind, envious, prideful, filled with loud arguments, devious, unreliable, suspicious, insecure, and it usually ends badly. Uh, of course, the exception is a Hallmark family movie or a, a Christian-based movie. And being raised from childhood, watching that type of love portrayed, it's unsurprising that life imitates art. Agape love seldom ever appeared outside of the New Testament, but it's the most common uh, form of love in, in the New Testament. When agape first appeared, it shocked those who were only aware of eros or phileo. People had been yearning, they'd been searching for this kind of love, but had never found it. It's because our fallen nature, we can't produce this kind of agape on our own. Can't give what you don't have. It only comes from one source in the universe. Only those uh, who love God can love others with that agape. 
Romans 5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. 1 John 4, 19, we love because God loved us first. Everything God is, everything he does flows from this kind of love and God is agape. He loves the unlovable, the unlovely, not because we're worthy, but because that's who God is and what he offers. And you can't find it anywhere else, so don't waste any time looking for love in all the wrong places. God's love is shown by what it does. Romans 5 verse 8, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Ephesians 2 verse 4, God is so rich in mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. When he raised Christ from the dead, it's only by God's grace that you've been saved. Give God the same love that God gives you. That's the goal. He demonstrated it by giving his son as a sacrifice. What can we give to show our love back to him? Love needs to be our number one priority. 1 Corinthians describes perfect love, and it's impossible to love to that extent of 1 Corinthians 13 unless we're in a good relationship with God. Agape, sacrifices. Ephesians 5 verse 1, walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. 1 John 4 10, this is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. 1 John 3, 16, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. And those are just a, a couple of the 320 times that agape is used in the New Testament. It says, I love you, even when you don't act in a very lovable way. I love you when it's inconvenient and not reciprocated. And sometimes it's found amongst the elderly. Uh, but what if they can't or they won't respond? Should I love them then? Or if they can't or won't give back to me as much as I give to them, do I have to love them then? Agape says, I love you when you're undeserving. I love you enough to sacrifice for your benefit. Agape is the term of love that a husband should have for his wife. Ephesians 5.25, husbands agape your wives, just as Christ agape the church and gave himself up for her. It's the love a parent has for a child, even if the child doesn't appreciate it. God teaches us this kind of love sometimes by bringing unlovely people into our lives. John 17.23, Jesus says, I and them and you and me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. How do you love the unlovely? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, do good. That's a way to show love. Luke 6, 27, I, but to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Do it simply because Jesus told us to. Don't let feelings determine actions. Let obedience to God determine our actions. Verse 28, Jesus said, speak blessings, bless those who curse you. It's hard to do, but it's not impossible with Jesus. We start by refusing to speak badly or negatively to or about another person. Verse 28, Jesus said, pray for them. Pray for those who hurt you. Speak a blessing on them to God, even if you have to do so with gritted teeth. Return good for evil, Jesus said, verse 29. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. In order to stop a fire, don't feed it. Repay evil with love. And number five, verse 35, he says, give without expectation, lend to them. Don't be concerned about the fact they won't repay. It's sacrificial, it's unconditional. And finally, the sixth thing, be compassionate. Verse 36, try to show as much compassion as your father does. And compassion isn't just feeling sorry for somebody. 
but it feels the pain and desires to end a person's suffering. Why, is, why should we spend so much energy on this? It's because that's God's number one priority. You remember in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six, 36, someone asked Jesus, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important, love. Your neighbor is yourself, the entire law, all the demands of the prophets are based on these two. Agape is the most important thing in the world. Fifty-five times the Bible commands Christians to love. Let me give you just a couple. 1 Corinthians 14.1, let love be your highest goal. 1 Corinthians 16.14, do everything with love. Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. Ephesians 5, 2, live a life filled with love following the example of Christ. Hebrews 10, 24, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love. And, and finally, Colossians 3, 14, love is more important than anything else. It's what ties everything completely together. And since it's God's number one priority, it needs to be ours as well. It's God's best gift. Spiritual gifts chapter ended in chapter 12 with these words. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And you go to the next chapter. That's the love chapter. Verse 13 in that chapter says, Three things will last forever. forever faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Colossians 3.14, most of all, let love guide your life. 1 Peter 4.8, 4, most important of all, Peter says, continue to show deep love. 1 Corinthians 13.8, all the special gifts and powers from God will someday come to an end, but love goes on forever. And in God's evaluation of our life when we stand before him, he'll ask, how well did you love me? as your God, and love others. 1 Corinthians 13 defines love. Chapter 13 has 13 verses, and it's the greatest ex explanation of love on earth. Many uh, think that that 13th chapter is the greatest chapter of the Bible. And of course, Corinth had it all messed up. They didn't understand love. The Christians in Corinth had all the spiritual gifts, it says back in chapter 1, except the best one. And that's why they were the most dysfunctional church in the New Testament. Chapter 12 is a description of gifts. Chapter 14 is a description of the exercise of the gifts. And Paul put love smack dab in the middle of those two chapters. And he showed the restraints of love on the gifts. Does the exercise of your gift promote love for everybody. And then before resuming the spiritual gifts in chapter 14, Paul says in chapter 14, verse 1, let love be your highest goal. And that's because when love is missing, the gifts are meaningless. Priority of love is covered in the first three verses of the 13th chapter. The rest of the chapter develops the first three verses. It just expounds on those verses. So let me read the first three. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secrets and possessed all knowledge, if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. So to summarize, if we don't love, we're noisy, obnoxious, we're nothing, we have gained nothing during our life here on earth. We are me-centered rather than agape-centered. We could speak great words, tongues, prophecy, but without love, it's nothing. And so what do we take away from this? I personally think that the coronavirus outbreak might be our agape test, that 
things, if it gets a lot worse, will test us with the love of God. In letters of crimson, God wrote his love on the hillside long ago. For you and me, Jesus died, and love's greatest story was told. Down through the ages, God wrote his love with the same hands that suffered and bled, giving all that he had to give, a message so easily read, I love you. That's what Calvary said, I love you, written in red. And that's what we take away. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we have missed thousands, tens of thousands of opportunities to show this kind of love. But Lord, you've wiped the slate clean through the love of Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for us. So Father, as we leave here, let's love with the love that we've received from you. Unconditional, unstoppable, loving the unworthy, because we are unworthy and you love us. Lord, even as you are agape, we pray that we might be as well. As the coronavirus gets worse, we're going to be given many, many opportunities to show this kind of love if we will comply with your word and be obedient. We love you, Lord. Bless us as we go forth from this place and prove our love to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.